everyone, I am Dr. Ravina, NHS doctor specialised in women's health, and I'd like to welcome you to this dedicated channel for women's health, where we discuss all taboo topics and get the questions answered that you're too worried to ask anyone. If you'd like to drop any comments in the box below, feel free and I'll get back to you. Alternatively, you can private message me on Instagram at dr.ravina. You can also listen to our podcast at Fertility and Femtech, and you can download our free ebook down below. Now, today we'll be talking about endometrial cancer. And this is one episode in a series of episodes where we have lots of information on ovarian cancer, specifically because it's Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month in March. So we'll be covering that. We'll be covering cervical cancer and what happens on your cervical smear. We also talk about breast cancer and how to check your breasts. And I will put the thumbnails over here so you can check out those videos after this one. Now, let's talk about endometrial cancer. Now, I would not want to wish cancer on anyone. It's a really hard topic to talk about, and you're probably watching this video because you've just been diagnosed with endometrial cancer, or you know someone close to you who has been diagnosed. Now, what I'd like to say about endometrial cancer is, it's probably one of the best ones to have out of all of them. Cancer's never a nice thing, but the survival rates with endometrial cancer are quite high. More than 70% of people will survive more than 10 years with endometrial cancer, which is really excellent. Endometrial cancer is one of the top cancers affecting women, specifically over the age of 40. And we'll be talking about what signs and symptoms that you should be looking out for and also be discussing with your mums and your sisters and your grandmothers so that they're also aware of what to look for. What I'd like to talk about with you is cover the key symptoms. I'd then like to cover the protective factors and risk factors. I'd then like to tell you about what happens if you get the diagnosis or have symptoms. So the investigations you get done by your doctor and then the treatment for it as well. So let's start with what is endometrial cancer? Well, en the endometrium is your womb and it's the lining of your womb specifically. So this is a photo of your womb and as you can see, you have your ovaries, you have your tubes and then you have this pear-like structure in the middle which is hollow and can stretch to accommodate a baby and that is your womb. And your womb has three layers. So the endometrium is the innermost lining of your womb and this is where blood is shed during your monthly cycle. You then have your second layer which is your myometrium and this is a muscular layer. So this is where your uterus will contract to give you contractions during childbirth, but it's also responsible for the pain that you may experience during your monthly cycle as period pain. That contraction of the muscle is what allows the blood to be shed from the innermost lining of your womb. And on the outside, you have the perimetrium, which is the outside lining of your womb. So with endometrial cancer, this is the cancer affecting the innermost lining. It's also known as cancer of the womb or uterine cancer. So let's now move on to the signs and symptoms that you need to be aware of in order to spot if this is a red flag that indicates endometrial cancer. So the first is postmenopausal bleeding. So menopause is defined as at least a year of not having any periods. So if you've not had any periods for a very long period of time, and then you get a bleed after having that period of absence of menstruation, then that's a red flag and you need to let your doctor know about it. Other symptoms to be aware of are abnormal bleeding. So intermenstrual bleeding, which is bleeding um, between one period of one month and the next period of the next month. So if you get any bleeding or spotting in between those, those two months, then that's a red flag. If you get any bleeding after sexual intercourse, also known as postcoital bleeding, and also any pain during sexual intercourse. Another thing to be aware of is if you feel any abnormal masses or lumps in your tummy, then we need to know about it, as well as any new abdominal pain that you haven't experienced before. So those are the most common symptoms that I need you to be aware of. So there's also some abnormal type symptoms that aren't classically known as endometrial cancer, but you should let us know because they're rarer type of symptoms that women can experience. So one is blood in the urine. So if you see any blood, whether this, this is when you're wiping or mixed in in the pan in your urine, then you need to let us know about it because it's not only endometrial cancer that we need to be worried about, it's also bladder and kidney cancer. Also any new pain, so pain in your back or pain in your hips, any issue with the pelvis can cause pain to radiate to the local surrounding area, being the hips, the pelvis, the back. So please let us know if you have any of those symptoms. So let's move on to the causes of endometrial cancer and the factors that put you or your family members at higher risk of developing it. First thing is age. 
aged between 40 and 74 puts you at higher risk of developing endometrial cancer, which unfortunately isn't something we can change and we can't stop ourselves from aging. But the next point is something we can change, and that is the risk of becoming overweight or obese. Now we know one in three cases of endometrial cancer are caused by obesity. That is an enormous amount. That means 33 out of 100 women who have endometrial cancer have got it because they're overweight or obese. So the reason why this happens is because as you have more fat cells, you have more adipocytes and adipocytes can increase your circulating estrogen in your bloodstream. And this then puts higher risk of the womb developing more cells that can divide, grow, and then have a chance of mutating to cause a cancer. So one thing we can do is reduce the weight. So also related to estrogen is HRT. And being on HRT can increase the risk of endometrial cancer if you're only given estrogen HRT without estrogen and progesterone. If you're someone who's thinking about going on HRT or if you've been on HRT, then you may be aware that one of the key questions that you get asked is if you have a womb. Now, if you have a womb, then of course you're at risk of endometrial cancer. But if we've removed the womb, then you would be a candidate for estrogen only HRT. If you have a womb, we will need to give you progesterone as well as the estrogen. And it's the progesterone that protects you from endometrial cancer because you don't have the unopposed estrogen in your system. So just to break that down into clearer language, rather than just having the estrogen that's circulating around your body, you get given progesterone instead, which balances the hormone and stops that risk of endometrial cancer developing in your womb. Another condition that is really common in society is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I have done a video on this if you want to learn more or you're worried that you may be someone who has this disease. With polycystic ovarian syndrome, you, there is an increased risk of endometrial cancer. And the reason why this happens is because you don't menstruate as often as other women because you have irregular cycles and longer cycles. Because you have longer cycles, you are at increased risk of your womb having a thicker layer of cells and differentiating into cancer cells. This is known as endometrial hyperplasia. Unfortunately, with PCOS, you are also at higher risk of not just endometrial cancer, but also type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance and obesity. So it's really important that if you have PCOS, you're aware of the symptoms of endometrial cancer. So I've spoken about some of the risk factors that put you at higher risk of developing endometrial cancer. But what are the protective factors? The protective factors of endometrial cancer are one, having children. So having a large number of children means that you're gonna have less periods during the nine months of being pregnant. Therefore, the endometrium, which is the lining of the womb, won't be stripped and you don't have as much growth of new cells in your womb. Just because of the same reason, being on the combined oral contraceptive pill also is a protective factor against endometrial cancer. Exercise decreases your body weight, which is also protective as it means you don't have as many fat cells, which can increase your circulating estrogen. So what happens when you go to the doctor if you've had any of these signs and symptoms? Well, the first is a medical history. So we'll discuss the key signs and symptoms that you've been experiencing, trying to identify any red flags. We'll then do a gynecological examination. This may involve feeling your tummy and then also doing internal examination, either with our fingers, which is known as a bimanual examination, where we insert fingers into the vaginal canal so that we can feel around the pelvic cavity. We then also may do a speculum examination, which is similar to your smear test. We insert a speculum, have a look at the cervix to see if there's any active bleeding or any damage to the cervix itself. If there's anything we're worried about, we will then refer you to the gynecology department where you'll get a transvaginal ultrasound. So this is a scan of your womb and your pelvic organs to identify the thickness of the womb lining. If it's thicker than what we would like, we would then decide whether we need to do a biopsy or whether we can leave it and do a surveillance scan in maybe one year or three years to then decide if we need to take a biopsy if that layer of the endometrium increases, which is known as endometrial hyperplasia. If you need a biopsy, you'll then have a hysteroscopy, which is where we insert a microscope to look into the womb, and we then take a sample of cells from the womb itself. 
This is then sent to the lab and we identify if these cells are cancerous or not. And that helps us to stratify your risk of developing cancer. If it's something we need to further investigate, you'll get additional scans like a CT scan or an MRI. Okay, so now let's move on to the treatment and management available for you. So depending on how far the cancer has spread, we'll be able to do various different things. The first thing and the most common thing is we just remove the womb. As I said, this affects mainly postmenopausal women. So at this time, many women have completed their families. They don't want any more children and they're most likely menopausal, so can't have children anyway. So removing the womb is one of the first things we do. The second thing, depending on how advanced the cancer is, is we can offer chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy. And this is something that the gynecology doctor will discuss with you alongside the oncology doctor to decide what is the best treatment personalized plan for you. So let's finish up by talking about survival. The survival in endometrial cancer is very, very good. And the reason for that is because women are quite good at spotting the symptoms of their body, especially when it comes to abnormal bleeding in the postmenopausal woman. So in stage one endometrial cancer, the rate of survival at five years post-diagnosis is more than 90%, which is a very high amount. At stage two, this drops to more than 75%. At stage three, it's about 50%, and at stage four, it's about 15%. So as you can see, endometrial cancer is one of the cancers that is something we can treat, but it is also really important that you share the key signs and symptoms associated with endometrial cancer with the people that you love. So the key symptoms I want you to remember are postmenopausal bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, so bleeding in between your periods, periods that are a bit heavier than you're used to, and also any uh, bleeding after sex or any pain during sex. Please do share this video with the people that are close to you because it's really important that everyone's aware of the key symptoms to look out for. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Until next time, take care, bye.